Okay, very good. All right, so let's look at uh, the next topic, estimation theory. So if you want, you can also <clears throat> uh, look at uh, lecture number 16, in my notes on the web. If you uh, chat uh, uh, under the McGraw-Hill website, uh, mean square estimation. So this comes under, estimation is a big topic. I already gave you a flavor of it last week in terms of uh, maximum likelihood estimator for a parameter. In other words, uh, this is a slightly different problem. So, so look at the way, so this is, uh, this is called usually uh, time series analysis because you have a one realization of some stochastic process, which I represent by X of T. And uh, uh, sometimes, I mean, you have some data observations here. Uh, so um, let's say this is, uh, so you have some data. So this is, uh, this is obviously, if this is the present, wherever you are, that's the present, and this is all future. And this is all past, obviously. So generally, we know the data in the past, including the present. And the problem is to estimate uh, what is going to happen uh, tomorrow. So I'm going to call it uh, Xn plus 1, or a few days from now, Xn plus k. So y is the unknown. So in this case, y is Xn plus 1, or y is Xn plus k. So this we call, so remember, y is unknown. So we want to estimate the uh, unknown in terms of the known. So estimate unknown in terms of the known data. So here the idea is all these are part of a stochastic process. So you understand, uh, this is obviously Xn, <coughs> excuse me, this is X1, etc. So all these are random variables. If it is white sun stationary, their autocorrelation depends on Ta minus Tj, etc. And this is the unknown. So uh, y hat is an estimate. We will call it y hat. See, unknown is y in terms of data is x1, x2, etc., xn. So estimate the unknown y in terms of. So y hat is estimate for y in terms of data. So data is x1, x2, etc., xn. Uh, instead of writing this x1 through xn, I'm just going to write it like this a vector. So y hat is some function of the data. Remember, y hat will be known because we are going to express in terms of this function of the data. So you can see y minus y hat is the error. Y minus y hat. Of course, y hat is a function of data. You can write it like this. Remember, this is the data. So or you can write this as y minus a phi of x. That's so. This is y hat. So this is the error. So remember, and if you look at the beginning of the lecture, I wrote the best. So what does it mean by best estimation? Best estimation or best estimator? So this is the estimation problem. You are given some data. So you can think of this as the stock values of over the last uh, thirty days. You want to know what will happen tomorrow or one week from now. So these are uh, prediction problems, right? Predict, you, are, you want to predict prediction. If you're trying, you can also say what happened uh, one month back here. So that is uh, into the past. It's also extrapolation. Sometimes you may say, I want to predict in between. So that's interpolation in between. So, uh, so the question is, as I was saying, what do we mean by best? So best is uh, 
the best will have to be have some strategy. So you we minimize something. Right? So naturally, for electrical engineers, uh, what happens is remember this is a random quantity because everything here is random. So minimizing the error is to make sense. So obviously, error itself is random. So uh, minimize uh, mean squared energy. Or uh, if it, since everything is uh, uh, so, uh, mean squared energy will be something like this. You have the this is the energy voltage, the square of it is like uh, power, expected value is average power. So remember that's going to be a epsilon squared, whatever is the density function of epsilon d epsilon. So this is if epsilon is zero mean, this is like uh, the variance. So, so now you see you can express all this uh, in terms of. Uh, in terms of the quantities we have studied. So this is what uh, we mean by uh, best. So minimize a mean square error. So this is also known as uh, MMSC estimate. A minimization of the mean square error. So that's the criteria we are going to use uh, to define best. I remember, uh, initially I told you uh, best estimation. So, question is what do we mean by best? So, uh, so I'm uh, so let me let me actually uh, do that. Uh, let's look at how far we can go with this idea. So I'm going to uh, minimize uh, the variance of the error. So variance is going to be expected value of epsilon squared. So remember, we studied all this. Epsilon is y minus y hat. So how many random variables are here? Remember, data has got n random variables. There is another random variable here. So if you want to write this, this will be y minus phi x squared multiplied by the joint density function of y, x1, etc., x. So this is x, uh, fx, uh, d, uh, dy, right? x1, x2, etc., xn. So this is an n dimensional integral. I'm going, and you will see the reason because there are too many variables here. I'm going to write this uh, this density function, I'm going to condition it and write it as y given x multiplied by fxx. So this is going to be double uh, integral y minus phi x, the whole square, f y given x dy, so that's this integral, multiplied by fxx dx. So we can write it like this. But if you look at this quantity, this is the conditional mean of y given x for this quantity. So I'm going to write it as conditional mean of y given x. And that's a non-negative quantity, right? So I hope you see what I'm doing. We, we want to, this is our goal. Remember, the unknown quantity is this function phi. We don't know which function is the best function. So if you look at here, we want to minimize this over phi. And if you look outside, there is no phi here. Phi is only in the middle term. And this is po everything is positive here. This is positive, this is positive, this is positive. So it's enough to minimize this quantity because this is where the phi is. This is a function of phi. So I'm going to write that conditional mean out in the here. So what we want to minimize is this conditional mean, this expression, uh, y minus uh, phi x, or y, x dx. Remember the x is conditioned here. x is conditioned here, so uh, this is, uh, we, to minimize this, we can take the derivative with respect to this, because it is frozen here, This you can consider this as a function and I take the derivative with respect to phi. So that becomes, uh, these are constant limits, so the derivative goes inside. So this is 2 my y minus phi x multiplied by the derivative of this with respect to phi. That's going to be minus 1. I put it here. f y given x dx should be 0. So if I expand, I get two terms. I get phi x multiplied by f y given x dx minus integral y 
f y given x dx equal to zero. So I bring this thing to the uh, I take this term to the other side, and remember this. Uh, I'm sorry, the variable here is uh, y, not x. So all the x terms. This is only a function with respect to y integration. So phi x you can take it outside. So this reads phi x multiplied by integral y given x dy equals integral y f y given x dy. Notice here, I, I copied this wrongly. The previous, this should be dy. So this is dy, 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 etc. But look at this quantity. We studied this. Anyone? What is this quantity? For a random value of y given x. What is that? This one I mean. Expected what? value of y given x. Yeah, that's the conditional mean of y given x, right? Expected value of y given x equal to x. X means x1, x2, etc., xn. So this is the conditional mean. If you want, you can write it like this. And look at it. What is the value of this integral? This is a, a density function integrated. So what do you get? One. Yeah, so we get to the function we are looking for. This is a famous result. The best estimator is the conditional mean. So you can see the significance of the conditional mean now. And uh, so going back here, we wanted to minimize this. So if you minimize this, you get conditional mean as the best, best estimator for y. This function is the conditional mean. And if you want to find out the residual mean, so y hat is expected value of y given x, uh, et cetera, x. And this is the best estimator. And the minimum value of the sigma squared, uh, y given x is going to be, you substitute that. So that's going to be expected value of y given uh, mu y given x to the whole square. So this is the conditional variance of y given x. So that's the minimum value of the error. Any questions? All right, so the, uh, uh, the So as you know, in general, the conditional mean can be a nonlinear function. So that's the thing to keep in mind. That is, this function can be nonlinear. And uh, so, of course, we can, uh, you know, you should be, uh, I mean, we did this problem, so you can take a density function to try to find out the conditional mean, etc. cetera. So uh, the joint density, so another thing is, if you want to compute this, you need to know the joint density function, or at least because this expression is y multiplied by conditional density function of y given x. So you need to know this density function. So the first observation is it can be, no, non-linear, etc. So that comes us to to the next topic. Uh, what if I don't want to deal with the non-linearity? How do I find the best linear estimate? Okay. Before I move on, any questions on this? On the best? so the one result you need to notice is. Uh, best minimum mean squared error estimator can be nonlinear unless it unless they are Gaussian. So uh, um, I'll come to that point in a second. So let's look at the uh, if you say that uh, I want to I don't want to deal with the nonlinear. You give me the best linear estimator. So what we are asking is I want uh, this to be. Sigma ai xi i equal to one through n. I put the minus sign here. You'll see why 
a little later, but let's uh, sort of uh, look at this. So this is a linear estimator. So I want to find why. Remember, you are trying to find out why maybe some unknown. I mean, this is the best estimator for y. Y could be xn plus 1 or xn plus k. As I said, if y is if y is xn plus 1, we call it one step predictor. If y is xn plus k, we call it the k step predictor. So this is a one step predictor because uh, what is unknown is only one step ahead. This is called a k, the value, finding the value here is called a k step uh, ahead predictor. So that's why I'm going to, I'll, later I'll come to make it uh, one step. But right now, let me leave it as open like this. So y is unknown. x1 to x1 through xn known so y hat equal to sigma ai xn so here we are taking a linear structure so again the same idea y minus y hat we want to minimize this is the error so because of this minus sign this will be now y plus sigma ai xi i equal to 1 through n and if i make if i put later y equal to xn plus 1 as the unknown then you see I can uh, write this uh, nicely. So if I put, if I make this substitution, y is this, then this simply becomes a i x i i equal to one through n plus one, with the understanding that a n plus one is one. I'll come to this a bit later. That's why I put that minus sign there. So again, the same idea. We will never minimize the error. We will, we will square the error and minimize the mean squared error. So again, criterion is MMSC. That means minimize the error, mean squared error. So here the minimization is on AIs. AIs are the unknowns. So this is uh, uh, was, uh, a, a expected value of sigma ai xi squared. We want to minimize. Remember, you have uh, discrete parameters a1 through an. So the natural thing to do is to take the derivative with respect to ai, aj, let's say, and see what happens. So here the derivative is going to be expected value. Remember, this is a complex quantity. So this is like epsilon multiplied by epsilon star. So it is, if it is real, it is going to be two times epsilon multiplied by the derivative of epsilon. So this is two times epsilon star multiplied by the derivative of epsilon with respect to aj. If it is real, it, this will be just epsilon. This should be equal to zero. Epsilon is here. This is, uh, this is epsilon. So what will happen if I take the derivative of epsilon with respect to aj? Anyone? No, epsilon is here. So epsilon, derivative of epsilon with respect to aj will be one. Okay. What? Zero. Look at here again. Epsilon here, this one runs through a1, a2, aj up to a. What will be the day? j is of course one of these. j is not. Xj. Yeah, it will be xj, right. So the condition for uh, minimization turns out to be uh, two cancels. So minimization of uh, what do you call it? epsilon squared uh, leads to uh, d epsilon squared expectation with respect to aj. So that comes out to be epsilon star xj should be zero. And j could be one through n. And if I take, so I can write it like this.
So this is the way the condition turns out to be. See, for two random variables, do you remember what did we call this expression? When you call an express, expected value of xy equal to zero, what do you call those two random variables? Anyone? What? Orthogonal. 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 So this is called the orthogonality principle. So in linear estimation, this is the big deal. In nonlinear estimation, the big deal is the best estimator is always the conditional mean of the unknown. Here, conditional mean of the unknown given the data. Only problem is, as I said, to compute this, you need to know the density function. If you say, I don't have any idea about the density function, then we can't do this, we come here. We try to do the best uh, linear estimation. So that's where we are. So when you do the estimation, again, the same thing, we minimize the mean squared error with respect to AIs or AJs. And uh, that leads to this condition. Error is a random variable. So it says, you, you should remember this, error is orthogonal to all the data points. That's what it does. This is data. This is error. Error is what? Error is x is uh, epsilon is what? Y minus y hat. Y minus sigma ai xi. That's error. This is orthogonal to all the data. Uh, j equal to 1 through n. All the data points, that's what I'm saying. So this is the key here. So to solve the linear estimation, and remember there are n data points, and there are n unknowns, a1, a2, a3, etc., an. So you, it looks like we have enough equations to solve them. So what was the, so remember epsilon was y, y plus sigma ai xi, i equal to one through n. And expected value of epsilon xj star is expected value of y plus sigma ai xi multiplied by xj star equal to zero. So if I put this in, uh, so I have uh, two equations, right? Expected value of summation. You see here, expected value of this multiplied by this, expected value of uh, AI, AIs are here, expected value of Xi, Xj. equal to summation expected value of y xj star j equal to one through n so you get this is we can let's call it rij and let, let me call this to be gamma yj because with the unknown this is the cross correlation this is the auto correlation rij is expected value of xi xj star so i get i equal to one through n so we get such a, uh, so I can put this in a matrix form, right? So this is R11. So look here. So this is j equal to one, j equal to two, etc. Now let me define this to be R J I. Then I can write it neatly even. So two, this is j equal to one, j equal to two, etc. So this is an autocorrelation matrix. This is a vector. So you get this equation, R A equal to N. So again, we are back to how to, I remember I told you, Saturday we'll discuss 
equations like this ax equal to b how to solve it you should all of you are graduate students you should know how to solve it you say we know your answer is that's easy but you have to deal with the, these three cases suppose r is like this or r is like this or r is like this so this is n by n this is m by n but m is greater than n this is m by n but m is less than n and moreover you all as i said read up on rank and so on these matrices may have rank less than their size etc so how do you solve with all that so assuming this is full rank rank of r is n then r a equal to gamma of course you can solve as r inverse gamma so we got a a is this vector a1 a2 etc an and if you look at sigma squared minimum So let's also compute the sigma squared minimum. Sigma squared is uh, expected value of epsilon squared. I have to substitute this r here. So this is epsilon multiplied by epsilon star. So this is going to be, uh, this epsilon is what? Uh, so this if I explain one epsilon, this is going to be epsilon y minus sigma a i x i i equal to one through n star. So star here, star here, star here, right? star here. Let me expand here. You have two equations. Ep expected value of epsilon y star minus summation a i star expected value of epsilon x i star. Over here, I took this epsilon inside and multiplied on the two terms. Anybody, what is the what is this term? Anyone? These AIs are the optimum AIs. Look at here. At the optimum AI, you remember the key expression. When you collect the data, but when you are, when the AJs are the perfect, uh, or in other words, optimum, then you have this expression, which is error is orthogonal to data. So error is orthogonal to data points when you have the AI is the optimum. So you take the AI is the optimum, uh, you can solve it from this equation. And then when we compute to recompute, these AIs are such that error is orthogonal to data. So what will be this term? Anybody? Hello? Zero. Zero, right. This term goes to zero. So error is just this. So sigma squared minimum turns out to be expected value of epsilon y star only from here. So let me substitute for epsilon again. So epsilon is y minus summation a i x i i equal to one through n multiplied by y star. So this is expected value of y squared minus sigma a i expected value of y x i star star. I just pull the star outside so that this star star here x i star here. Only reason is because we Little earlier, I defined that to be expected value of y x j star to be gamma y j. So that will be gamma y j star. And so I can write this as, so this is like, uh, if you want, you can call it r y y minus I'm using the matrix notation. Why I am doing this? Because I already have the solution for A, this vector A. Where is it? 
Here is here, right? R inverse gamma. And if you look at gamma, gamma is exactly the same as this with the transpose. So this is simply gamma star. If you define, if you look at that, this is what we defined gamma. So you need to sort of go through this manipulation yourself and make sure. And uh, because everything is not brute force, so this is gamma yy. This is like the power of y, py, if you want. Gamma yy minus gamma star multiplied by a. And a is here. A is r inverse gamma. So this you get r yy minus gamma star r inverse gamma. So this must be positive. So this is another thing to show. How do you know that this will be positive? I will also show you that a little later. So that's sort of the uh, uh, so for example, at a two by R Y Y Y is not a matrix, right? This it's one? just a scalar value, right? This one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's look at it. See, look at here, y. y is the unknown, so y, uh, this is a scalar obviously, so we are squaring the scalar and taking the expected value, so that will be a positive quantity, like a power. You are absolutely right, that's a scalar, not a matrix. So the only matrix here is this, capital R, and these are vectors, but this will be also a scalar. So a scalar minus scalar, right? This is a vector, this is a vector, so I, so I, that's why I said you should go home and uh, after the class try to do some of these manipulations because I, these are very standard material, so you should know this and so in a couple of weeks uh, you should expect some problem like this in, a, in one of these tests. And I already went over matrix algebra last Saturday, we will again go over a little bit of this, so as I said, Stochastic processes is a big topic, and uh, linear prediction is uh, the, whatever I am discussing. This is also a this is bread and butter. You should know this quite well because any any area, whatever research you do, there will be some estimation problem, and you should know how to manipulate matrices, and uh, you should definitely should know basic uh, linear uh, basic uh, linear estimation. Uh, it may not be all, so let's do a two by two case, just to, so remember this is the case. So for two by two, you just have this matrix. So two by two case will be uh, R11, R12, R21, R22. Yeah, you can all, you don't need a matrix, uh, but gamma one, gamma uh, Y1, gamma Y2. So you can either do to, uh, uh, just as two linear equations and two unknowns. So anyway, solve for A1 and A2. So uh, many ways you can do it. But if you have many variables, so let me give you the complete solution I so, uh, so that you understand. So what was the problem here? Problem was, so let's just quickly recall this. Um, Xi's are unknown, Y is unknown. So we took the error, mean squared error, we took the derivative with respect to AJs, the unknown quantities the, that we want to look, and that gave us this orthogonality principle. So this is a very uh, famous and the only rule. So you should know what orthogonality means. Again, don't confuse uh, something with something. Error is orthogonal to data, nothing else. Uh, we are, so we are not, not the unknown is orthogonal to data. We are, so. Error. Error is, of course, unknown minus the estimate. That's the error. So, error, I mean, error is not orthogonal to the unknown. Error is orthogonal to the data. And that's what it comes up. That gives us uh, n equations, and you can put it in matrix form. So, the solutions are A equal to R inverse gamma. <coughs> and the mean square error is, I gave you the expression here. And this will be positive, but you have to show this. Any questions? Uh, 
So if you want a two by two, you guess you can do it uh, by hand. And uh, what do I want to say here? I'll come back to this in a little uh, little while about So let me give you a, a result. Yeah, this is actually a theorem. What says is that if the data and the unknown are jointly Gaussian, uh, then the best estimator So I hope you, you can read what I wrote. I'm going to prove it for you. Again, all these are classic results. Of course, it is new to you, but it is not new to, these are known for 50, what about 50, 70 years. Anybody working in any of this, so you should know it too. It's like the first steps. So let me prove it. Uh, so I'll, if it is not zero mean, we can subtract the zero mean and make it zero mean. So the data is what? X1, X2, X etc, Xn. Unknown is Y. So our assumption is the data and unknown are jointly Gaussian. Then the best nonlinear, anybody what? In general, if they forget about Gaussian, in general, the best nonlinear estimator is what? We did this. What is the best nonlinear estimator? Hello. How do you get the best the value of y given x? Right. So this is the best nonlinear estimator, and uh, so this is the. We, I'm going to show. And what is the best linear estimator? What is the condition on that? Anybody? Hello. The orthogonality principle. Right, right. Uh, so you select the A such that, so you say it like this, select the A such that this is the best estimator, but the error is orthogonal to data, right? Uh, that's the orthogonality principle, right? So look what I wrote. I put an L here showing that we are talking about the linear error. All right, so you have to listen to it carefully, the proof. I'm going to show that these two are the same. That's the whole point. I'm going to show these two are the same. I hope everybody is following me. And these are important because things like this could come in an exam. Because in the second half, I will be, my goal will be to uh, test your understanding. It's not going to be plugging the formula and going home. Okay, so first part is a little easy. At least once you understand the mechanics of doing things, you can do it. The second part, you need to understand what is going on in the with uh, that way you can begin to think, and then you can think of new problems, how to apply, and so on. So please don't sit here saying that. Let me look at the formula, then I'll uh, plug in the formula into the problem and get the result and go home. You will not be able to do any one of my tests. So you, that's why it is important to understand the theory, what is going on. And so if someone asks you, why is the best, why is the, in the Gaussian case, a linear estimator is the best estimator, you should be able to give a proof or proof or reasoning. Which is what I'm, so what I'm saying is, if the data and the unknowns are Gaussian, the best estimator is always linear. But we know that the best estimator is this one. So we are, I'm going to show that the conditional mean will be always uh, linear. That's what I'm going to show. So let me see how the uh, proof goes. <laughs> So 
So look here, I put here the best nonlinear estimator is I put NL, nonlinear estimator is this one. We know, we already did this. And this is the best linear estimator while you have. I am going to show that this is what I want to show. I'm going to show you this. So I hope you understand this. Then you should be able to put it in words. So what I'm, once again, what I'm saying is in the Gaussian case, then everything is Gaussian. Unknown is Gaussian. The data is Gaussian. When everything is Gaussian, the best is, uh, look at the last line. The two estimators are the same. So at least in the Gaussian case, you don't have to worry about uh, whether I should do nonlinear or linear, etc. You do the linear, that's the best. So uh, let's look at, uh, so the best linear estimator is sigma ai xi, and the linear error is y minus yl hat. And here, of course, this error, yeah, here uh, the error, error is orthogonal to the data. I'll put, again, I'm putting this L so that, uh, you know, that this is what we know in the linear case. And if you, uh, so we, we have uh, the, the, this expression that error is orthogonal to data. And this is true for J equal to, of course, one through N. And uh, if you look at uh, expected value of XL, XL, epsilon L is what? Epsilon L is the previous line, expected value of Y minus YL hat. So that summation AI, expected value of xi look at here all these are zero mean this is zero mean so this is zero each because each of them is expected value zero not because this is equal to this so if you look at this we can write like this expected value of this is zero and we also have this expression See here, this expression and this expression, I put it together. Both are equal to zero, so I can write it like this. So this is true. So this is the key punchline here. Just pay attention here. Why is the last line true? Anybody? Why is this equality true? Anyone? Hello. They're independent. They are not, no, no, no. That is the false argument. I never spoke about independence or anything. Why is this? I, I just look at here. Equal zero. What is that? Uh, it is equal. Both sides are zero. Right. Exactly. Look at here. I showed that expected value of XL is zero. This is where I showed that. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we showed that. Orthogonality, this, this is given by orthogonality principle. Here they have zero mean, but both are zero, so I can equate them. Because it doesn't matter, this is also zero. So zero equal to zero, but if you look at this, this reads now like this, expected value of xy is expected value of x multiplied by expected value. What do you call this condition, anybody? When two random variables have this property, what do you call it? Uncorrelated. Yeah, because rho xy is zero, so we call it uncorrelated. But remember, we are looking at everything is Gaussian here. Epsilon is Gaussian because all the data is Gaussian, y is Gaussian, linear combination is Gaussian. So if x is Gaussian, epsilon is Gaussian, x is Gaussian. If two Gaussian random variables are uncorrelated, they are also? Independent. Independent. So we get the conclusion that epsilon and so we conclude that epsilon and epsilon and xj's are independent. It 
it's only because they're Gaussian though that they're independent, right? It's not necessarily for that case. It's not necessarily that they're always independent if they're uncorrelated, right? Right. So remember the theorem. We are only dealing with the Gaussian data, right? That's why the Gaussian right. was involved. Understand? Right. Okay. If the right. if this Gaussian was not true, you are absolutely right. We will fail here. All this right. will be true, but we cannot conclude they are independent, right? Okay. They are Gaussian and uncorrelated. That means they are independent, right? And uh, so if, if these random variables are independent, anybody, what will be the value of this? Anyone? These random variables are epsilon L is independent of these random variables. So what will be the conditional expectation of uh, y given x if y and x are independent? Same as? Expected value of epsilon. It will be same as the expected value. But this we already took it to be zero, right? Yes? Yeah, because look look at here, somewhere here. Expected value of epsilon is zero. I showed you from expression two. So this is zero. So now let me substitute for epsilon L. Epsilon L is, so epsilon L is Y minus YL hat. So this is going to be expected value of Y minus YL hat is AI XI I equal to one through N. Conditioned on all the XJs is zero. So I have two expressions. This is the expected value of y conditioned on all the x equal to summation ai expected value of xi conditioned on all the x's. Anybody, what will be the value of expected value of x conditioned on x? Anyone? Think about it. What is the expected value of x conditioned on x? X is given, so expected, uh, if X is given, expected value of X, given X equal to X, huh? X, I. What did you say? X, Y. X, X itself. Yeah. Yeah, what will be the expected value of X squared if X is given? X scale. X squared, right. So this is just X, I. So you get Sigma A, I, X, I. But look at this, this is the linear estimator for YL hat. And look at here, this is the nonlinear estimator for YL hat. So we proved that these two are equal. I hope you didn't miss anything. This is the nonlinear estimator equal to the linear estimator. That's what we wanted to prove. So this is a very important result, as I said. Uh, look at the theorem. The theorem says if all the if all the unknowns and known quantities are jointly Gaussian. Then the best estimator, which is the nonlinear estimator, is also the linear estimator. Is the best linear estimator. So just do the linear case. Um, when you jump to the expected value of e sub l given x um, equals zero, how did you get that result again? Here. Um, I think it's on the next page. Yes. So here, yes, here, yes. Yeah, yeah, look at the, these two random variables are independent. What happens if two, what is the, condi remember that was, a, that was a, what is the conditional probability of A given B if A and B are independent? Anybody? Just A. Just yeah. a so what is the conditional density yeah. function of X given Y if X and Y are independent? It's just X. F X X, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, girls, you see what I'm saying? If these two random variables are independent, its expected value conditioned on something is the same as the unconditional expected value. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. so it's all pure, pure logic. So that's right. why you should follow the logic. Okay. Everything we, you can see, everything we learned in the previous course is coming up. Look at here. X and Y are independent. Then we know F of Y given X is the same F f x comma y over f x x right? right right if this is independent then this is f x multiplied by f y over f x f x cancels you get it. so expected value of epsilon given x j is the same as x expected value of epsilon given x j but if these two are independent this is just a, this one right right 
but that will be zero because earlier we showed that expected uh, yeah epsilon is uh, epsilon minus uh, x y minus x is both are zero mean. Professor, why the expected value of epsilon L is zero? Uh, say it again. Uh, why the expected value of epsilon L is zero? So look at here, epsilon L is what? Y minus Y hat, Y L hat, right? Yes. Yeah, here. So uh, expected value of Y is zero because because it is given, uh, starting the unknown is zero mean. And here, all these XIs are zero mean. Look at what we started with here. Or if the data and unknown are zero mean jointly goes here. Oh, sorry, I missed the zero mean. Well, uh, yeah, everything is zero mean. Y is zero mean, XIs are zero mean. So Y expected value, Y, it doesn't matter what the values of A, epsilon L will be zero mean. Okay, okay, got it, thank you. So everything is tight. You should go home and prove uh, because I I definitely could ask in a one of the tests to prove this. For example, this is a in the when the date when the unknown and the known quantities are jointly Gaussian. Uh, prove that. Uh, so uh, think of uh, what we have proved is when the if you have many random variables which are jointly Gaussian, what we are proving is the condition. So anybody has an answer to this? So this is what we studied so far. Of course, they have a joint density function. they have a joint density function. From here, I can find a conditional density function of Okay, I can find the conditional density function. From the conditional density function, I can find the conditional mean of How do you find the conditional mean if I have the conditional density function? What? How will I find the conditional mean of this given these random variables? Anybody? Hello? If I know a random variable and I know, this is xn plus 1 condition on this. So conditional mean will be what? Anyone? Integration of x uh, n plus 1 times density function. X and plus one, I'm going to, this is true, right? Yes. yes or no? This is the mean of, I don't have to write X and plus one, that's just a dummy variable, X, 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 right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, as I said, I can write N plus one, but it doesn't matter. Now, from the previous theorem, what do you, you can say blindly something. If all these random variables are jointly Gaussian, this condition and mean will be what? Will have what property? Anybody? Let me see your brain is working or not. What can you conclude about this conditional mean? Anyone? How will you, of course, it will be a function of xn, xn, xn minus 1, etc, x1. What kind of function will it be? Anyone? Hello, if you have been paying attention. A linear function? function? Yes, linear function. See, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't give you any density function, but you are able to conclude something. So let's again understand what I'm saying. If a, a bunch of random variables are jointly Gaussian, if you take any one random variable and find the conditional density function of that with respect to others, and then when you do the conditional mean of any one of them with respect to all the other ones, this function is going to be some linear function of 
uh, the uh, 1 through n. That's what we just proved. What these quantities, that's a different question. But I just proved, we, this is what we also proved. So you should always remember this. If a, bunch, if a, random, if a set of random variables are jointly Gaussian, the conditional mean is always going to be linear. And for two random variables, I think in the last class, I actually did it for you. There is a video of that result. Y and X are jointly Gaussian. The conditional mean is a rho sigma of Y given X is a rho sigma X divided by sigma Y multiplied by X, linear function. So all, all these are related results because the argument is uh, this is the conditional mean happens to be the best nonlinear estimator, but that must be linear. So you should be able to get the conditional mean in this form. So for some unknown bi's, you should be able to write this as bi xi. Any questions before I proceed? So again, if X1, X2, If x1, x2, x3, etc., xn, xn plus 1 are jointly Gaussian, and if you want to find the conditional mean of x1, any one of them, x1, in terms of the other random variable, n random variables, uh, so the theorem, what we have just concluded, you should be able to show that that conditional mean is a linear function of the other one. You can only say this for Gaussian. If they are Poisson or geometric or something, not the, you have to do it. We cannot make such a statement. All right, so uh, since I wrote a conditional density function, So if you have a bunch of random variables, you have their joint density function with uh, all these random variables. And remember, I can write this as, I can keep writing it as conditional, right? Xn plus one, given, call this to be Y. So that's Xn comma Xn minus one, etc. X2, X1. Uh, then multiplied by f of xn, etc., xn my x1, right? This comes here. And then I can go to the next line. I can write this as f of xn, given xn minus 1, etc., up to x1, multiplied by f xn minus 1, etc., x1. And I can keep going this way. Now a process, a, uh, and of course, if all this came from some process x of n, then we call sometimes the uh, the these conditional density functions have the property that a process may have this property. You can think of this as memory because. For the current random variable xn plus 1, given all this, there are processes for which this conditional density function only depends on the one previous value. So this conditional density function only depends on the previous value. We call such processes to be a Markov process. If I have time, I'll go over this later. So a Markov process has, if x of n is Markov, then f of xn plus one condition on all the previous values uh, depends only on the, uh, just the previous value. 
So this is the Markov property. Uh, the, this is the all past So I, I hope you understand what I wrote. The, the density function of the current random variable given all given the entire past. Uh, entire past is useless. Entire past is affected only through the latest uh, recent most recent past. All the other data are irrelevant. So a joint density function of xn plus one, xn etc. x x one can be written as f of xn plus one only depends on xn and xn look at here uh, you, this one depends only on xn then this one is uh, this one only depends on this one this one only depends on the previous one so we can keep going like this xn depends only on xn minus one etc x2 only depends on x1 multiplied by fx1 so if this is true uh, this is the markov property a Markov process has this property. I should have told that last week or week before. And uh, so this is a Markov process is a discrete time process. So if you consider each time instant as one state, so a random variable can jump from one state to the other state. When it jumps, it only matters where it was. It doesn't matter, the entire past is irrelevant. Remember, when you go to a grocery store, what matters is just what is the amount or what is the it's a state at that at that in other words how well it is stocked at that point it doesn't matter the last one month it was stocked well all that history is irrelevant to you so in a lot of problems what only matters is what just happened at the previous night or previous step so if the previous step is if the place got well stocked then that's all it matters for the next uh, so for you to buy and stuff it that's all it matters the fact that day before that it was good the day before that it was all well stocked and when you go in if it is not stocked so a lot of uh, things at all, all that really matters is the most recent past there are processes like this and uh, so we will uh, maybe towards the end i will there are some properties i want to discuss about uh, that process also so let me move on with uh, so I hope you got this side of result, right? If you have a bunch of random variables, the conditional mean of any one of them based on the other ones is always a linear function. Again, I can ask you to prove it. You should be able to prove it. So the proof uses the previous. Uh, so let me move on with the uh, predictor. So y is unknown. So this is your y. Y hat you is your estimate for y based on all these things. So this is the best linear estimator, obviously. So we went through this, so I, I don't have to redo all this stuff. All we have to do is in the earlier expressions uh, where we had uh, y, I'm going to substitute xn plus 1. So if you remember, the previous equations uh, turned out to be 
error which is y minus uh, y hat will be xn plus 1 plus sigma ai xi i equal to 1 through n. As I said, with this notation, I can simply write it as ai xi i goes from 1 through n plus 1. We should keep in mind that a n plus 1 is 1, right? Here it is a n plus 1 is 1. So this is the error. And the error is orthogonal to data. So you get, this gives us expected value of epsilon j star is 0. We went through all this, so I'm going to go through quickly. j equal to 1 through n. And uh, so expected value of epsilon xj star. Remember, epsilon is sigma ai xi i equal to 1 through n plus 1 xj star is 0. So so let's assume uh, I'm going to make some uh, So as before, the expected value goes inside. So this gives you the equations AI expected value of Xi Xj star equal to zero. J goes from one through n, n plus one equations. Now I'm going to, uh, let's assume that this Xi came from a Whiteson stationary processes so that Rij, I am going to write it as uh, I minus J. Remember, the autocorrelation is symmetric function. So R, R tau is R star of minus tau. So this is uh, T, uh, this is T1 minus T2, right? So this expression I can write the summation AI R I minus J. Hold on, I'm thinking something. Yeah, let me write this as uh, J minus I. It does, I mean, we have to stick to one notation. So this is the T2 minus T1. No, I guess. Uh, All right, I'm going back to, I think, uh, here. So I'm going to call it Ri minus J. Let's see. You will see the reason. So this I'm going to write it as Ai Ri minus J, I equal to 1 through n plus 1 equal to 0, J equal to 1 through n. So look at here. There are, and keep in mind that An plus 1 is 1. And we have, I am going to rewrite these equations, but there is also equation for sigma squared is epsilon, expected value of epsilon squared. Remember, this is the linear case. I've done it before, and I'm just specially doing it for a, an important step, a one step. What is going to happen tomorrow? This is always, that's the what we mean by, if this is the temperature in the last n days, give me an estimator for tomorrow. And here, remember, this is epsilon multiplied by error is orthogonal to data. Epsilon star is, what is it? Uh, Xn plus 1 plus summation i equal to 1 through Nxi. So this is data. This is not data. This is the unknown. Error is orthogonal to the data. So, of course, you get this to be epsilon xn plus 1. You Previously we had a y here, that's all. So this is going to be I just rewrote this expression because I need it. This expression I just rewrote it here. And the, this last expression is uh, sigma squared is, look at here. Sigma squared is epsilon. Instead of epsilon, I'm going to put summation AI 
xi i equal to 1 through n plus 1 multiplied by n plus 1. So the i minus j, so that's going to be summation ai or i minus n minus 1 equal to equal to not zero because i equal to sigma squared so let me put do you have any equations here or another equation so so i'm going to put everything into a matrix form so look at the first equation equal to zero second equation equal to zero etc equal to zero and the other last equation is equal to sigma squared okay so let's fill up here look at the unknowns a1 a2, etc., an, and the last unknown is an plus one. This is your an plus one. And here, look at here. I is one, j is one. So this is R0, I is two, R1, R2, etc., Rn. The n plus one, I is n plus one, j is one. Here it is, I is one, j is two. 1 minus 2 is minus 1, but R minus 1 is here. R has the property that it's also R J minus I star. So this is R minus 1, or I can write it as R1 star. Then the next one, I is 2, J is 2. So this is R0. I is 3, J is 2. So this is R1, R2, or N minus 1. So next one, you check it out. You should go home and check this. It has this nice pattern. So you look at this, all the diagonal entries are the same. So this is a toplex matrix. I am using this expression. We have seen this before. I'm just do, using a special case of one step prediction of a Whiteson stationary process. Where did this Whiteson stationarity come in here? I am assuming that this Rij is a function of Ri minus j. This is where the Whiteson stationary comes in. So I get uh, this equation. So again, you can see you are dealing with a matrix. This is all there in my lecture 16. This is uh, page uh, 14, 16, 43, I guess, uh, page 19. Right? Any questions? So far, so the question is, uh, what is the unknowns here? A1 through An are unknown. Sigma squared is unknown. Of course, one is known, but it's in the wrong place. <clears throat> so you can see the uh, there are n plus one unknowns and n plus one equations because n equations here, one equation here. So we have enough equations, and this I'm going to mark it as T N. T for toplex, okay. N is saying that the last entry is N. But look at the size, it's starting with the zero. So this matrix is of size N plus one by N plus one. This is a well studied matrix in the literature. There is actually books on, if you type in Google toplex matrices, you can see books on it. What are its eigenvalues, eigenfunctions and so on. So you can see each topic is just two, uh, it's a big topic. And of course I'm trying to give you an idea, but depending on your interest, you can branch off. And uh, 
So I think, uh, I think maybe Gernander or Sego has written a book on called the Toplitz matrices and its applications. So you can see clearly a Toplitz matrix uh, coming up here. See now you have, uh, I mean, if you keep doing this, uh, so you have to worry about the rank of the Toplitz matrix. What if it is singular? What if it is uh, 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 not a singular, etc. So we will only consider, we will consider that everything is good. We will consider the matrix to be non-singular. In other words, a full rank. So if, if, it, if I make this notation, so you see, I can write this as if you want uh, the A vector, which is A1, A2, et cetera, AN and 1, to be uh, this TN inverse multiplied by 0, 0, 0, 0, sigma squared. And uh, so, how do you find the? Uh, uh, so, right, let me write T N inverse like this. So, T N inverse. I am going to write like this. This is just zero, zero, zero. Sigma square, I'm going to pull out. So this will be one. I hope you see what I'm trying to see. This is just a constant here, equal to this. I hope you can see this. This is a standard notation. If A is a matrix Aij, and then inverse matrix people usually write on the top Aij. So these are the entries of the inverse of the matrix. So that's why I wrote it on the top. Look at here. Uh, this is the inverse of this matrix. Uh, these are the entries. So this is going to be just the last column, right? So this answer is 1 over sigma squared multiplied by Remember, I made a mistake. This is uh, uh, there are n plus one entries, right? So the matrix, this matrix size will be n plus one comma n plus. <coughs> this is just this column. This last column is what is this column comes and sits here. So I can read. Look at here. You bring in the sigma squared here, so you get. I hope you see that uh, sigma squared. Uh, sigma squared is going to be T of n plus 1 comma n plus 1. <coughs> then you plug it in here and you can read A1 through A n. What was the problem? The problem was trying to find out this AIs, and I have some completely solved it here, right? So we have this we have this matrix, and I solve for the AIs, and they come out to be this. And this is the minimum mean squared value is given by the so you take T, take its inverse, then you find the last entry there. That's what this is of this. That you can write it like this if you want. So this entry, you have to show that that will be positive also. Now what? Anybody, are we up to here with me? No. <clears throat> that T matrix, is that the Toplitz matrix? Yeah, yes, exactly. Right. Look at here. 
So call this T, this is the, the equation is of the form T multiplied by A is uh, some vector here, right? Yes, T uh, multiplied by A is this vector, right? Okay, I see, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't see the bottom half of the page there. Okay, let me put it here. I mean, why didn't you tell me actually? Uh, oh, I, sorry, yeah, I just didn't see it. Yeah, yeah, when you can't see it, you let me know. So again here, you see this T matrix, right? You, you can see this, T multiplied by A is this vector, right? Yes. And so that's the same as T multiplied by A is this. And so A is going to be T inverse multiplied by this vector. And I wrote T inverse in this form. So essentially you are grabbing, because of all these zeros, you're just grabbing the last column of T inverse. Uh, Professor, why uh, schema scale convert, uh, change it as one of uh, schema? power two. Oh, what did you say? Um, just to use, when you multiply into T inverse, I'm, not, I'm in the this page, the previous page. So you just uh, put out the sigma scale as, a uh, sigma as sigma, uh, one of a sigma scale. <coughs> yeah, yeah, maybe I made a mistake. Hold on, let me see. Uh, it should be, I should just uh, pull out the, uh, Sigma squared. Let me see. Yeah, maybe. So let's redo it again. Uh, so A is going to be T inverse multiplied by zero, 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 sigma squared. I'm saying I can do pull this. It shouldn't be one over. It should be just, yeah, you are right. It should be like this. So this is, and A is what? A is uh, A1, A2, in one. So if I write, uh, so this I can write sigma squared, and this matrix I'm going to write T11, T1 comma N plus one, because it's an N plus one, but this is N plus one comma one, and the last entry is N plus one comma N plus one. And this is T1, T2 comma N plus one, etc. Multiplied by zero, 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 one. So this is going to be sigma squared multiplied by the last column. So that's T1 comma N plus one, right? Last column of this uh, gets pulled out, two comma N plus one, T of N plus one comma N plus one. So you are right, if you create one is, equal, so you get the expression one equal to sigma squared multiplied by N plus one comma. N. So I made a mistake. It should be sigma squared is one over that, you're right. And now I, if I plug it into here, you get uh, A1 through AN, maybe I wrote that part correctly, I think, is one over T N plus one comma N plus one, multiplied by this vector, one comma N plus one, two comma N plus one, etc. N comma N plus one. So these are the unknowns. Remember X, XN plus one hat is minus sigma AI XI. So these A's are given from here, from the autocorrelation matrix. And uh, the variance, sigma, the minimum value of sigma squared is the inverse of Tn plus, Tn plus one comma N plus one. It's the inverse, that's a, that's a scalar quantity, but it's uh, inverse is the, there are other ways to express this also maybe I may move on to something else. Let me see. Any questions? Uh, professor, why this sigma is minimum? Sigma squared is a mean square error. What was the question? Why you use the uh, minimum of here uh, in here of sigma square? So look at here. So this should be uh, remember when when you have when you try to minimize the error, you have this condition, right? 
and we went through all this so what error once you 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 see the condition this will be minimum i just didn't want to carry i'm just going to write sigma squared is actually sigma minimum because i put the uh, orthogonality condition here error is orthogonal to data right yes yes and so you get this expression this is for the uh, so here this should be sigma minimum squared but i'm just going to call it sigma squared Oh, okay. And Thank you. This, yeah, this sigma squared is what here is. So this is actually sigma minimum. So if it is a two by two case, you can do it very easily. Remember, this is the inverse matrix of the toplex matrix. And uh, there is a little more to this. Maybe I'll stop this and do some problems which are a little, uh, I talked about it last time. And then maybe. Yeah, let me show maybe let me show you one result which I think you should be able to. Look at this problem. So you have data here, same data. You're trying to predict uh, one step ahead at x n plus one, and this is uh, two steps ahead. So this is the one step of predictor here. And this is the two step ahead predictor. Use the same data. We are using the same past data to end. Uh, so the error should be orthogonal to data. That's how you pick up these AIs. Here, BI, same thing. You want to pick up such that the error is orthogonal to the data. We can pick up the BIs. Again, you form the equation. So my question to you is you have minimum mean squared error in two cases. One is for this unknown, another one is this unknown. Which one do you expect to be smaller? Anyone? N plus one. Huh? The N X or uh, the error for two, or no, one, sorry. Yeah, why? Well, there will obviously be more uncertainty associated with if you're yeah, predicting so, more so than one step. Common, common sense is. Uh, they are, you are right. So the one is, uh, so, so uh, listen to the problem. So one is, uh, I mean, this is, um, of, uh, yeah, as you said, it looks like there is more, uns you are saying there is more uncertainty here compared to here, right? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, uh, which of this, uh, 
That's one problem. Let me give you another problem. So what was your answer? What was your answer? Sigma 1 squared, Sigma 2 squared. Which one is smaller? Um, sigma 1 squared. Okay, so we'll come back to this again. So everybody, anybody else has any answer, any questions, any suggestions? Hello? In this problem, which one is, I mean, things like this could come up in an exam. Here you need to think. It's not as easy as uh, finding, throwing some value into a equation and solving it. I guess uh, sigma one squared is the lower bound of sigma two squared. Right. Now let me show you another problem before I look at this. Can you read what I'm writing? Do you understand the problem? Hello? Yes, Professor. So uh, what is the what is the problem? I I, I, I have what is the problem? You tell me what is the problem I have written. Uh, Professor, in the second graph, shouldn't it be x n plus two? Uh, no, just read what I wrote. What does it say? So what is the, what is it? Anybody, anybody can describe the two problems I wrote there? What's the difference? Yeah, so let's read it. What is the first problem? Trying to estimate xn plus 1 from what? Uh, in data. In the, from the past, right? Yeah, in the past, yeah. And what is and we think of the best linear estimator and say there is an error of sigma one squared. Look at the second problem. What is the second problem? To estimate x n uh, plus one from the n plus one data. Right. You are trying to estimate the same unknown, but with more data or with less data from the past. In the second case. We have more data. More data, right? So if you do the, uh, if you do uh, here, you are going to have some a i x i i equal to one through n, and you again minimize the mean squared error, you get some sigma one squared. Here, this is going to be I'll write it b i with a minus sign b i x i, but i equal to zero through x n, right? Because you have more data here. And so my question is, we haven't done anything. I'm again going to ask you your common sense. Giles, which one is which one will be smaller? I think my one um, sigma two squared. Will be smaller? I think yeah. sigma one scale. What? Somebody said sigma one? I think my one, yeah. Sigma one will be smaller? Yeah, I think so. Look at the look at the pro you don't need a uh, rocket science here. Look at the first case. Same unknown. In the first case, you have uh, what is given to you is xn through xn, x1. In the second case, you have that and you have little more data, x0. So which one will be a better case in terms of mean square error? Hello? Uh, sigma 2 squared. Yeah, sure. because look at this general, general, general if you have, if whatever is the error in the first case, how can you do any worse if I give you more data? Even if, if it is garbage, you just throw it away. Yes? Yes. I think this goes to Aristotle, right? Or Greeks. If you get more data, you cannot be in any worse situation. Right? So if you have $10 in your hand and somebody gives you $1 more, why will you be worse? So you are saying, are you saying, uh, is that what all of you are saying? 
Yes? Uh, yes, Professor. All right. No, I, I want you to prove it. That's from common sense. Because only when you prove it, this will be true. I'll tell you the reason to prove where was the other sheet. Is it because there is a 1 over n factor here? No, no, no. I'm going to prove it for you maybe, or maybe, maybe not today. Think of what I'm saying. Just use your brain. In this case, I have, whatever it is, I have data x1 through xn from the past, right? And however good I do, I'm going to have some error. In this case, you have more data. So even if you ignore this, you will be as good as this case. And with this data, you cannot do any worse than this. You see that I don't need any science for here. You can say common sense ways that if you give me more data, I cannot do any worse than the previous case. Look at here, I am not moving this post. This post is the same. So if you give me more and more data from the past, I will be, uh, my case will, be, my error will be, this is a better case. So the, the first case is essentially equivalent to setting one, or the second case, no, the first case is essentially equivalent to the second case with setting one of the b's equal to zero. No, 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 no. That, I, that is also false. That is uh, also false? Okay. The, uh, I'm saying, think of it, how you, uh, maybe I won't prove it today, but I'm going to ask you to think about this. The first case is, whatever it is, you have n data points here, right? N data from the past, right? This is not data, sure. this is unknown, xn plus 1. Data is here, yes? Right. And you have n data, you know how to find the best estimator, you'll get some mean square error, right? Um, right. Sigma 1 squared. Now in the second case, think, of, think like a kid. You are given more data. So I'll set up the BAs, but the argument is the new data cannot hurt me because if it hurts me, I'll throw it away. So there will never be a situation where this case will do worse than this because if it is doing worse than this, I won't take this data as you said. Right. So it is very clear whatever you do with the B, it doesn't matter how you compute, you cannot end up with a worse situation with more data. Okay. That is, but this is only a bullshit argument, right? Just words. Now, I want you to prove this <laughs> mathematically. In fact, I'll okay. do it for you. I don't think we have time this week. But what you're saying is true. But I think common sense only goes so far because let me come back to this problem. This is a different problem. Remember, this is what we went over this. I have an unknown here, I have an unknown here. You said, what did you say? Which, if I estimate this unknown using the same data set, which which one did you say will have a smaller error? Um, the one, the estimator for n plus one would be smaller. Have, yeah, sigma, uh, uh, sigma uh, uh, squared for n plus one will be smaller, right? Yes, Professor. That's what the common sense says, right? You're just saying we're talking about, you haven't done anything, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. So that is, that's actually false. That's where you learn this course. So, I mean, of course, a man on the street also would say the same thing because it looks reasonable. So I will give you examples. That's the way I'm going to show false. I'm not saying all the time, but we can find the cases where this could be, uh, this will uh, have smaller error compared to so that's completely against the common sense. But that's the nature of the stochastic uh, problems, right? So both I am going to ask you, in fact, that used to be one of my homework problems. Find an example where uh, this is uh, not true. But now let, there is a catch. So uh, take the same problem. Then, uh, but suppose, so again, it is the same problem. This is n plus one, this is n plus two. Okay, so what am I saying here? Do you pictorially see what I'm trying to say? Uh, these two are unknowns, but I'm given this data all the way, everything in the past. You understand the difference? Uh, yes. What is the difference? Um, 
so it would be that uh, well, you're predicting two steps ahead for no, no, um, you're confusing. Everything is one step. It's exactly the same problem. This is one step ahead. This is n, n plus one, n plus two. What's the difference between this problem and this problem? Uh, the, in the first question, we the data we have is like a subset of a bigger data. Yeah, this is look, the second this is, one. We have all the data. Possibly. This is only finite past. Look at here. You only have n samples. Here you have uh, entire past is given, all the way to infinity. Now what you so here you know what is sigma one squared, right? I don't have to go through this. Sigma one squared is exactly the same. It is trying to estimate uh, this one based on all the data from the past. So here this is true. In other words, sigma 2 squared is larger than this. You understand what I'm trying to say? Now I do, yes, sorry. If the data set is finite, uh, so does it depend on the choice of the subset of data? Yeah, I mean, there, no, no, there are some stochastic processes for which uh, uh, this will be uh, smaller than this. That's all I'm trying to say. You can compute the, this is within your reach. You have to go home and do it. So what I would suggest is don't take n data sets complicated. Just take two data sets from the past. See whether you, so let me give you the, uh, you need to do some work because if everything I do, nothing will get, uh, so why don't you do this problem and show whether. Uh, so take this as a homework problem. If I, So try to find out estimate in terms of uh, you, go, I, I, you, you you do a, uh, do this problem. So try to find out linear estimators in both the cases. And, and uh, if I try to find out a case, you can clearly see it, where this error should be small, larger than this, but this error is yeah, so where this error is smaller than this. So try to find this error if I call it sigma one squared, and this error I call it sigma two squared. This is n plus one, this is n plus two. Then you can. Uh, show that sigma 2 squared can be smaller than sigma 1 squared. This will be one of your homework problems. Professor, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Will this inequality hold true for any subset of the past data? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying answer is maybe yes or no. We don't know. That's all the whole point. Okay. So the only case you can say for confidence is if you give me the entire past, what uh, you said is true. If you give me the entire pass, this will be the, this estimator will have smaller uh, error compared to this. If you give me a subset, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, so if I can um, prove in one subset, for one subset of the past data, that uh, sigma two squared is less than sigma one squared, um, does, it, uh, does it tell, tell me that um, any other subset of the data, past data that we choose, um, the inequality will. No, 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 obviously not. So that's what I'm saying. When you have subsets, uh, remember each case you have to do it, and uh, then you have to take whatever it gets. All I'm trying to say is common sense says if you go farther and farther, you have more error, right? Yes. I'm saying that you have to do it each case. In some cases, that may, most of the cases, that is true. 
but there are cases where there is not, that is not true also i see right but how do you know what i'm saying is true you have to do you have to find an example how do you find an example you go home and think about this that's how you learn this topic okay so what you said you try to prove this will be one of the homeworks please don't copy the homework i don't think this problem is uh, there from last year uh, but uh, so uh, i just want each of you to do a little bit thinking and so on right i will come back to this maybe next week but let me go on to something else an interesting problem which i started saying uh, i was going to prove this case but let's do it next week so again as i said oil exploration or somewhere you collect a lot of data so i gave you this problem uh, uh before so you generally in oil exploration etc you put lot of sensors here is an area where you expect oil uh, and you will put the, you drill holes and put my uh, whatever uh, acoustic microphones and do that and then you explode uh, create a transmit wave it goes through different layers and uh, you know it comes back uh, everywhere so you collect the data from the data you want to know uh, what is the uh, you know, signal whether there is a signal or not etc etc right so so what uh, so uh, so i am going to again look at linear estimation we need a so where is the motivation coming from as i said let's look at this problem uh, x equal to so this is uh so this is our classic problems that uh, we have signal plus noise buried in and uh, i want to uh, of course here the y is s s is the unknown so the so this is the problem signal present or not so I, you can call it the hypothesis testing the one hypothesis is is there signal and noise or is it noise alone right so what is the problem what is give me the best estimate for the signal that's the problem here another way to look at this is uh, x is uh, so here x is the data uh, this is what you observe data and this is what uh, your unknown is another one is uh, so this is an interesting model 
So if you go back to this, let me call this to be signal, okay, here, the, the oil. So these sensors, these sensors I'm going to call X. So X is of the form S plus N, some signal and noise coming at uh, various places. We don't know whether it is true, but so, so signal is buried in noise. So sometimes what people do is just to get an idea about the noise, you go somewhere far away and collect the returns coming from here. So that's, uh, remember the noise is due to all these uh, geo layers and the reflections and uh, uh, scatterings from rock and this and that. So as your assumption is whatever is the geology here, they are all sort of the same. And uh, so the second signal that you are getting here is uh, another version of the noise. This is the same noise, but this noise is now, remember, noise is noise. So it's not exactly going to be the same thing. When you, uh, when you observe here, there will be some other component which will disturb this noise here because the rock formations, etc., may not be exactly the same, uh, geology, locations, and so on. So this is another problem. Again, the question is, why he says, so we want what the best estimator. So let me, I'm going to give you these problems for homework. And I'm going to do one or two problems here now. So I, I gave you motivation. So right, these are the problems you will have. So we will do x equal to s plus n. That's one problem. Second problem is x1 is s plus n. x2 is uh, n plus w. So question is, what is the best estimator? This is your problem. So third one is uh, x1 is uh, s plus n, s2 is uh, also another version of s plus w, it's possible, right? The fourth one is, I'm just making up problems, x1 is s plus n, x2 is uh, what you call, uh, uh, multiplicative noise, let's say. This is multiplication. So I'll, I'll make up, uh, I'll solve a couple of them and uh, etc. So let's uh, go into what was the number? So let me go to uh, so all the data I'm, I'm going to call this in this form. So my unknown is y. So y hat I'm going to write it as hx. So y minus y hat. So this is a matrix, H is a matrix because X itself is uh, multiple data vectors. So you understand the problem? Uh, if you don't understand, please. Again, this is uh, wireless communication everywhere. Uh, what I'm trying to set up is the way problems are set up. So data, some unknowns. And this itself may be a matrix of data. So X is, uh, so matrix multiplied by matrix could be vector, or this could be, uh, if this is, if this is a vector, then this will be a, a, I mean, whatever is the appropriate size. If this is scalar, this will be a, 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 a row vector, right? This is a column vector, this is a row vector. If this is a matrix, if there are two unknowns here, then this will be two by n, whatever, depending on how many sensors you collect. See, the sensor data may be like this. May, it could be a matrix also. So depending on the data and depending on the unknowns, this could be a matrix, scalar, etc. So for example, if this is a scalar, it will be like this, and the data will be like this. That's the way I wrote. Remember, previously we had A1, A2, etc. and I put it on that side. So this is the error. We want to minimize the mean squared error, which will be y minus y hat, the whole square, expected value. 
So that's going to be expected value of uh, y, uh, y minus hx multiplied by, this is expected value of, remember absolute value squared means, norm squared means y minus y, y minus y hat multiplied by y minus y hat to transpose conjugate. So that will be the covariance matrix. It's the mean squared error is usually you take it the trace of the matrix to be. Anybody knows what is the trace of a matrix? Anyone? Trace means what? Sum of diagonal elements. Sum of? Diagonal elements. Yeah. Why is this? Because look at here. Uh, the important thing is sum of yi minus yi hat absolute value squared expected value. This is the variances of all the yis. So that's what it is. So that's the uh, notation we would uh, use. So I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Why is could be a vector? Why could be a vector? This is a vector, could be, then this will be a matrix. So in that case, you look at the covariance matrix and, and then uh, do the, uh, what you want to minimize is only this quantity, the variance of different, uh, Y will be remember like this, Y1, Y2, etc., YK. So you want to find the variances of this, of that minus its uh, estimator uh, squared. That's the variance of y i hat, etc. So sigma squared is the trace of expected value of y minus y hat multiplied by its transpose. So that's going to be y transpose minus y hat to transpose. So let me substitute for uh, remember, you need these equations to solve this problem. So what was my y, uh, y hat? That was hx multiplied by its transpose. That's x, x transpose, h transpose, y transpose. Remember, all these are vectors and matrices. So if I expand this, you will get trace of expected value of y, y star minus h here. Expected value of x. y star here yeah. and here you have minus expected value of y x star h star and the last term is x uh, expected value of x x star h star from here expanding so you should uh, again uh, so the expected value of y y star is r y r y y minus h, this is the cross correlation. So again, it's a beautiful application of what we learned. And if I call, so ryy is this term, rxy is this term, minus, this is rxy transpose. So that's rxy transpose h star. And this is expected value of uh, xx transpose, the covariance matrix of the data. So we want to minimize this, the minimization is on H. H could be a matrix, so you can't just do directly uh, the, uh, X, Y star. Did I do everything correctly? R X Y star X Y star. Right. H star means uh, complex conjugate transpose. Uh, professor, the mm -hmm. second line is uh, wrong. You can what is 
in the second line, the, you can see the uh, x transpose times x, x transpose minus y transpose. It would be y transpose minus x, x transpose times x, x transpose. Yeah, you are right. Why did I write that? So let me write this. I, th I think I wrote it correctly here, is it? See, here I wrote it correctly. I, yes, Professor, I think the rest is correct. It was just that. Yeah, yeah, line. it just that I slipped my mind. But you are right. Then only you'll get this correctly. So question is, look here. We want to minimize this. We want to minimize this over H. So you cannot do directly derivation, etc a derivative, etc. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a trick. So I'll come back to this sheet. So I wrote here a matrix to the power half. I think I might have explained to you last time. If you have a covariance matrix, you can do u lambda u star, right? If r is a positive deficit matrix, it's a it's a, a, a eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition. So this is u lambda one etc lambda n u star. U is unitary. So if I write this as instead of lambda 1, lambda 1 to the power half, etc., lambda n to the power half, u star u, lambda 1 to the power half, etc., lambda n to the power half, u star, then this is the r half, because u star u is identity, this is identity. So if I call this matrix, is the same as this. So each of them must be r half, r half. And similarly, r to the power minus half means u, u star, lambda 1 to the power minus half. I think I explained to you this last Saturday, lambda 2 to the power minus half, lambda n to the power minus. Now you say, if you are saying, oh, I don't care, I don't want to learn any of this stuff, then there is nothing you can do. You cannot solve these problems. That's the problem without knowing any or any uh, anything about matrices at this point. So if your idea is that, look, give me a program, I'll push into some numbers and, uh, you know, I'll give you a plot. Then you are out of this course at this point. And uh, you need to learn because this is going to hurt you in the final exam. No, I mean, in the, remember, with the today's uh, test, the probability portion will be over. Next week, I am I am going to start on uh, things we learned on stochastic processes. So it's getting going to be serious now on because you will not be able to do anything if you are not following me and not uh, catching up with the material. It is not going to be as easy as, uh, but I am not going to be too hard on you either. But the problems like this, what I'm giving you today, you should be able to do it. So this is what we mean by square root of a matrix. And uh, so that's what I mean by this R half and R to the... So you need to understand all this uh, reasonably thoroughly. And when I write this a matrix norm squared, anybody knows what this means? This means A multiplied by A transpose. So let me expand this, call this to be A. So that's going to be R X Y R X X minus half minus H R X X half. You'll see why I am doing this. Multiplied by its transpose. Remember, R is R is the same. R X X is the same as R X X transpose because it's a covariant. It's an autocorrelation matrix has this property. 
So if you take it, this is multiplied by its transpose R X Y R X X half minus F H R X X. Make sure I don't make mistakes. So I'm going to do the transpose here. <coughs> transpose is going to be R X X minus half R X Y transpose minus <coughs> R X X half H transpose. So let me multiply this with this. R X Y R X X minus half. <coughs> so I'm going to multiply this. Notice that this term is R X Y R X X minus because minus half minus half becomes minus one. R X Y star. This multiplied by this minus half and plus half goes away, so you get minus. R X Y H star. Here, this multiply the plus half and minus half goes away, so this is minus H R X Y, and the last term is minus H R X X <coughs> H half half is R. Now look at these three terms. Minus minus plus. So look at these three terms. They are the same as these three terms here. That's the whole point. So these three terms here is going to be this minus this. So I'm going to make it simple. I'm going to instead of writing these three terms, look at the signs here. H R X Y minus R R star. This should be R star. This should be H R X Y. Anyway, uh, we need so H R X Y uh, H star R X Y star maybe the star here and uh, H R X S H. So this. This, these three terms are the same as this. So these three terms are uh, this minus this, which is what I'm going to write it here. So you have minimization of trace of R Y Y. <coughs> then this minus this. So I'm going to write it as these three terms are this minus this. Maybe Saturday I'll do one of these problems when you come in if you don't have time now. All I did was I I, cop, I wrote these three terms as this minus this. I wrote it as here and here. Why am I doing all this? You can see the reason. You want to minimize, look at this expression. You want to minimize this on H. There is no H here. I just got rid of all this H. H is only here. So this term should be equated to zero to get the minimum. So this is why I went through all these crazy things in the next page. So go home and make sure what I did is correct. And then you can solve for H. So So from here, H is, so you have RXY, RXX minus half equal to H RXX half. So I can solve for H is going to be RXY, RXX inverse. So this is the solution we are looking for. So let me do one or two problems quickly, and then we'll go from there.
So what was the first problem? X equal to S plus N. So Professor, it's almost 515. <laughs> okay. Right, anyway, let me do one. We'll, uh, this is an easy exam. So everyone, uh, you understand, uh, I haven't made up my mind, but I think this will be a third minute test. Again, uh, let me explain to you the rules. If you have, I'm going to give one test as a makeup test a little later. So there will be three minute tests now, then three minute tests on the stochastic processes. We'll keep continuing. So next week onwards, you need to uh, sort of prepare on the material we have covered and so on. Or let me see, maybe I'll give you one more. I'll let you know by Saturday what we are going to test next week. But before the final week, there will be one makeup uh, test. So if any of you have done poorly in one uh, exam, you can use that exam as a makeup. So if you have done very well, you don't have to attend that exam. Then the final exam will be a smaller exam, maybe two hours. I'll give you two problems just to do it. Right? So let me just finish this uh, so that at least you see uh, how this is done. So we need to compute R X Y, right? Uh, X is X is the data, and Y is the unknown. This is your unknown Y. So this is expected value of uh, uh, S plus N multiplied by S. And we will assume that signal and noise are uncorrelated. So that's going to be expected value of S squared plus expected value of S. And so this I'm going to assume it is zero. So this is sigma x squared. And now you need Rxx. That's expected value of xx. X is uh, X is scalar here, just this. So this is expected value of S plus N, the whole square. That is expected value of S. So this is the way I expect you to do problems. Again, signal and noise are uncorrelated. So this is sigma X squared plus sigma N squared. So your H is actually here, RXY, RXX inverse, which is sigma S squared over sigma S squared plus sigma N squared. So that's easy, right? So, so your filter is H is 1 over 1 plus sigma N squared over sigma S squared. So you just multiply your data with this, uh, I mean, HX, which is your S. So this is your best estimator. So let's look at this problem. You can expect something. This is an interesting problem. You can, I will do this again on Saturday. You have heard about adaptive. See, this is noise. You want to cancel this noise. So you measure this noise nearby, but unfortunately you cannot measure the exact noise because everything is stochastic. So when you measure, even that is going to be contaminated. So I'm going to use this contaminated noise to cancer. So the question is how much of this should be used there to cancer? This problem will answer this. So as I said, this is what happens in a doctor's office also. So the doctor, suppose this is you, uh, the doctor put this is your heart so the doctor puts this stethoscope here to get some version of the signal plus noise to get rid of this noise this is the first observation x1 here this is where you make the x2 just to get the noise 
So what you hear is because it is not exactly at the same place, and I don't know all the anatomy, you are going to hear something other than the heart, uh, the blood, blood flow or whatever. Then the doctor will take the stethoscope and go back here and listen to this. Using the ear, the doctor is going to cancel this. Then come back and listen to this again. And then go back and listen. That's where you put... You adjust the paper. Did you say something? Could you adjust the paper? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So this is a big topic in your uh, office if you have air conditioner or whatever uh, some uh, exhaust fan keeps making noise how do you cancel it or in your car it's a billion dollar industry how do you make the car because of the engine there is always some noise when you sit in the car and you want to uh, measure it adaptively and then cancel it so you have to put all sensors all over that's what we are trying to do we put two sensors <laughs> But you don't, if you have the music, you don't want to cancel the music. You only want to cancel the engine noise. So you put uh, the, uh, some sensors near the engine. But as you can imagine, you cannot just uh, subtract it because that's not the way the noise is, right? So how do you, how do you take care of, uh, how do you cancel, how much should you cancel? And so it's also feedback. Uh, so adaptive uh, feedback cancellation or whatever. So let's do this problem. I don't know how much, if I don't complete it, we can do. So again, the formula is this one, Rxy, uh, what is it, Rxx inverse. So you have to compute all these quantities. Y is S, Rxy is, so except the data, look at the data. Now we have two data points, right? So X is X1, X2. So remember, S hat, so H is going to be like this. So this is what we are trying to find out, what will be this filter. This is your X. So R, X, what was it? R, X, Y. X is, So you, you go home and do it. I'll do it Saturday, I think. Otherwise, it will get. Uh, so you compute RxX, you compute RxX, RxY, you compute RxX, and then you do RxY, RxX inversely. Right? So this is uh, XY, X is here. And then y is, uh, as I said, y is your s, which this is your unknown. So uh, maybe let's finish it Saturday. And then, uh, but the, the homework will be based on this. So you, you wait till Saturday and then do the homework.